What's going on guys? I want to welcome you back to another Q&A video. As always, everything is timestamped and if you have any questions, leave them down below. So with that said, let's get started. First question, do you recommend 5x5 over push-pull legs? Okay, now this question doesn't really make that much sense because you're under the assumption that 5x5 is somehow exclusive to full body training. Now, I can understand you a little bit because you're kind of comparing strongless 5x5 and other 5x5 systems to split routines, but you have to understand that 5x5, five five, so five sets of five reps, can be done on any training program. It could be done on an upper lower. It could be done on a five-day bodybuilding bro split. It could be done no matter what your situation is. So this question that you're asking me, in actuality, does not even exist because you can't compare. You're comparing, like, what you're saying is this. What's better, three sets of 10 or a push-pull legs? Doesn't make sense. See what I'm saying? So, yeah, man, five by five. If you're doing an upper lower, it could be done. If you're doing a split, it could be done. Whatever program you're using, feel free to use it. Like, I fucking use it all the time on my uh, volume days. I'm not doing uh, strongless. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah, just get out of that trap, man. So that's that next question. Will running take away your mass? Okay, you hear this a lot, right? Like, cardio will take away all your gains. Like, you see memes sometimes of these fucking... You know what I'm talking about, right? You've seen the memes? Okay, cardio is only going to take away your mass if, A, it impedes your ability to recover, and, two, it causes a bunch of uh, strain on your joints. That's when it's going to cause you issues. But provided that you are re-eating the lost calories, right? I don't see any reason why you'd have... Uh, troubles recovering simple as that so if you decide to do 20 to 90 minutes of low intensity cardio what's the problem as long as you re-eat what you burn from that session you're going to be fine now when we talk about hit cardio that's when things start to take off to the next level but you're describing running here right you're not talking about hit and the reason why hit can cause issues is because it interferes with the training adaptations it's very similar to weight training in a sense so that's why it tends to cause issues but running is is apples and oranges man as long as you re-eat the lost calories you know and it's not affecting your ability to train hard in the gym, I don't see why you'd have issues. Like, there's guys who they fucking bike to work every day. But some guys even bike to go to the gym, do their workout. They're perfectly fine. Even I did it a while back. It was no issues whatsoever. So running is fine if you re-eat the lost calories, if it does not impede your ability to recover. And then the, 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 the joints thing, if you're too heavy, sometimes if you run, your knees are going to hurt. So my advice is to, first of all, assess how heavy you actually are. And two, learn proper running technique. And I know that Dr. Romanov made a, re a really good book on that. I think it was called The Pose Method of Running. A great read. I recommend you check it out if uh, running is bothering your joints. So that's that, man. Next question. Yo, Alex, what is your opinion on push-pull legs routine six days a week? Is it also a split routine? Yeah, it's a, it's a form of a split routine because it's, you're splitting all your pushing movements, which is like chest, shoulders, and tries, your pulls, you know, which is like back and buys, and then your legs. So that, that kind of is like a three-day split, but with two times a week muscle protein synthesis because you're training every muscle twice a week. Now, what is my thoughts on push-pull legs? The OG subs already know what's up. In some, I despise push-pull legs. I don't think they're optimal at all if you're an actual lifter because it's not fe like it's not efficient. It's not time efficient. Here's what I mean, right? If I decide to go to gym Tuesday and Friday, think about this, full body. I am getting two times a week muscle protein synthesis, right? Which is a process that is elevated for 48 hours, right? That's what happens when your muscles break down, right? And then they regenerate and that's what causes growth. So twice a week full body equals two times a week muscle protein synthesis, right? If I go in the gym and I decide to do an upper lower, right? Upper, lower, off, upper, lower. Guess what? That's also two times a week muscle protein synthesis. Now, if I decide to do push, pull, legs off, push, pull, legs off, repeat, guess what? It's also two times a week muscle protein synthesis. So what changed between full body, upper, lower, and push, pull, legs? The amount of times that you go to the fucking gym. Now, why the hell would you want to go to the gym six days a week? Six days to get the same protein synthesis as a full body twice a week and an upper lower four days a week. Do you see the logic in that? You're better off just doing an upper lower or full body and getting the extra rest in because that extra rest is going to do a lot for your fucking physique. I don't see why you'd split it up. And let me ask you this. Why do you have that desire to split it up so much? Are you that tired? Is your work capacity that shit that you can't do everything in one session? How hard is it to do your pushing and your pulls? You can easily, very easily, giant set the whole workout. You can, easily, you, you can easily combine bench press with barbell row. Overhead press with lap pull-down. You could do the same. You could do fucking supersets with that shit, man. It wouldn't be hard whatsoever if you adapt to it. I mean, this is what Brian Ellsworth does, man. Great guy, man. Check him out. Uh, he does strong, man, by the way. But for him, he just fucking giant sets the whole workout. Upper lower style, you know? That'll save you much more time. So at the end of the day, it comes down to time efficiency. 
Why the hell are you going to train six days a week to get two times a week muscle protein synthesis? And that's another thing. Guys are going to say, Alex, why do you like full body so much? Because it's time fucking efficient. I can go to the gym twice a week. People don't believe me. People do not believe me when I say I build this body of training twice a week. I swear to fucking God. It's the truth. Oh, and one final point. Do realize that it's still the same nervous system. So you may think, okay, it's the same uh, protein synthesis. Therefore, I'm going to make the same gains as an upper lower or a full body, right? Well, no, you're not because... You're still going to the same gym using the same nervous system. Guys don't think about this, right? But if I, let's say I decide to max out on my squats one day, right? And then I come back the next day and I max out on my bench. Then I come back again and I max out on fucking barbell rows. I'm still using that nervous system. I'm still doing one rep maxes. It's still putting strain on my body. So if you're going to the gym six days a week, you best believe that is doing more strain than an upper lower or a full body. So you're going to have shittier recovery as a result of doing this, even though the muscle groups are split. So that's why I don't like push pull legs. Are you going to make gains off it? Sure you will, but you're going to have to train a lot more than me. You have to have four extra days in the gym. Why? Just do an upper lower, man. So that, that's just my opinion on it. So that's that next question. Hey, Alex, where can we find all these exercise variations? Every time I come to your channel, I learn a new variation. Where did you dig those out of? I also have your books, but there's only pictures with exercises shown. Okay, some of the movements that you're going to see me do in my full body training videos are fucking exclusives. You're not going to find them in YouTube tutorials. You're not going to find them on conventional YouTube videos. You just won't. When you're going to find these exercises in underground sources, channels that have around 1,000 subscribers or less, or you're going to find it in a different sport that is unrelated to like the bodybuilding world. You're going to find shit from the powerlifting world, the strongman world, the wrestling world, the MMA world, the field athlete world. It comes from all those places. The arm wrestling world, you know, I have a ton of grip movements that come from there. The grip strength world, you know, grip sport is what they call it. And a lot of the times, these unconventional lifts are not even in fucking English. There have been many tutorials and many exercises shown in Naturally Enhanced that I had to learn from fucking uh, Russians, Greeks, people from overseas. People who I didn't even know what the fuck they were saying in the goddamn tutorial. I had no clue what they were saying. They'd be talking this foreign language, there'd be no subtitles, and I'd just be fucking observing. I'd just be looking at them and saying, okay, this is what they're doing. And I'd analyze it critically and say, okay, these are the benefits in doing it. You know, I shit you not. There are a lot of arm wrestling channels that I'm subscribed to. I don't know what the fuck they're saying. I have no clue. Every time they upload a new video, it's like foreign language. But I click on it anyways. I see what they're doing and I copy it. And then I start recommending it to you guys. And I see these same movements show up in several other channels as well. That's why uh, I know that they're fucking legit, you know. So that's why I get a lot of my lifts, man. A lot of uh, foreign languages, a lot of underground sources. I take from unconventional sources because I believe that unconventional training yields the best results. I mean, shit, you rack pulls above the knee, cheat shrugs, cheat rows, you know, direct neck work. That's kind of unconventional, right? But I brought it to the surface and now everybody's making gains off it. So uh, more on that soon. I'm actually going to make a video about unconventional training equals results. That's going to be the title of it. So stay tuned for that. And yeah, next question. If you eat about 170 grams of protein or more a day while on a calorie deficit, can you still build muscle or do you have to be in a calorie surplus? Okay, you're basically asking me if you have a high enough protein intake and you're in a calorie deficit, could you build muscle? My response is that if you get stronger, you're going to build muscle. Now, with 170 grams of protein while in the deficit, that's more than enough to maintain your size, right? And in terms of the gaining the strength part, well, that's going to depend on your, your program, you know? Some guys, they, they can't make fucking strength gains because their program is terrible. Others, they can make phenomenal strength gains. It's also going to depend upon your individual training experience. You know, the more advanced you are, the harder it's going to be to pull it off. But if you're like novice intermediate and you try going the calorie deficit and you're gaining strength, it means you're gaining muscle. Simple as that. Uh, because after neural adaptation sees, hypertrophy always occurs. That's why you see so many novices that they were overweight and now they come out of the novice phase a year later and they were fucking lean and they got big muscles. They gain mass while in the calorie deficit. And of course, again, if you have the higher protein intake, that could help retain some size that you might have lost if you didn't include that much protein. So in my opinion, if you gain strength, you're going to gain muscle. And that's dependent upon your individual strength level currently. So that's that next question. You said that weighted dips are an awesome exercise, which I fully agree on. But do you have a good alternative for people who can't do them? You can't really replace weighted dip because it's a body weight exercise. And it gives you like a very unique sensation there. Um, so that said, the best substitute, if you will, is a bench press. And not just a regular bench, but I'm going to say like a cambered bar bench, which is like a special bar that bends. And this bending action gives you more range of motion, right? So camber bar bench done with a pause. So do camber bar bench press with a pause. You're pretty much going to get the same benefits as a weighted dip. Again, though, the only problem is that you're not, it's not a body weight movement. It's external. You're pushing. So what I'm doing right now is kind of like comparing a lap pull down to weighted chin up. You see what I'm saying? So 
It's not totally the same, but it's going to give you similar benefits. You could also try out uh, the neutral grip dumbbell press. So take some dumbbells, neutral grip that shit, go really, really deep, wide grip it, you know, that should give you good benefits as well. And of course, the standard pause bench. You can even do the illegally wide pause grip bench, which is very strenuous on the rotator cuffs. But if you can handle it, be my guess. So yeah, those are my weighted dip substitutes. Next question. Alex, how would you progress to avoid plateaus on dips? Is it too advanced to attach only bands without a weight? I've noticed zero carryover from doing dips with only bands to free weights in three weeks. Should I use rings also? Okay, the dip, uh, there's lots of ways to get better at it. You can do the classical linear periodization approach, undulating. That should work pretty well for some time. But after that point, if you're doing the concurrent, which it seems like that's what you're doing, yes, you're going to want to start implementing new variations, such as uh, pause dips, dips off blocks, dips with band-only tension. Now, I don't know what your training experience is, but yeah, that is an advanced technique. When the band tension overrides the weight use, that's very advanced. And I wouldn't recommend it unless you're doing serious numbers on the dip. Like I would say minimum, minimum three plates before you attempt a variation like that. So maybe that's why you didn't really get carryover because it should have carry, it should have carryover, especially if you mix it in with straight weight because you could always do like 75% straight weight, 25% band tension. That works, does it not? So yeah, man, definitely lots of variations, having volume work, intensity work. That's how you raise your weight to dip. And in regards to ring dips, yeah, that's going to help you out a lot too, man. A lot of gymnasts that I know of, they have very strong ring dips. And when they go do the standard weighted dip, they're actually very strong, even though they don't practice the movement. So yeah, definitely implement that into your training if you have rings. And uh, yeah, good luck to you, sir. Next question. Wanted to hear your opinion on Mark Wahlberg. Possibly Natty, I'm talking about the pain and gain image. Okay, well, I've seen the movie. It was actually, I enjoyed it. I'm not gonna lie, I enjoyed it. And uh, honestly, I think he looks natural in that film. Now, the question is, is he natural in that film? I don't know. And who fucking cares? The point is, it's most likely an obtainable physique. And the thing you have to understand about Hollywood actors is that a lot of them just they take roids to get mass very quickly because they get a, a role in like fucking six months. They got to get super fit, you know, so it's like they're not going to gain muscle that fast. So a lot of them just roid up. But the thing is that roided physique you see many times is attainable naturally. You just got to train long enough to get it. So was Mark on roids during that film? I don't know. I personally don't give a fuck. All I do know is that for most guys, you can probably obtain such a physique. You just have to train long enough. And uh, yeah, he's actually fluffy too. He's fucking fluffy and he has that mass. Imagine if he were to shred down, he would lose a lot of it. So to me, it's not unrealistic. I, I would not say that's unrealistic whatsoever, but whether or not he used, I can't really answer that question. Same thing for like, you know, Thor, remember that Thor transformation? You know, some guys say that he's on roids. That's very possible. Maybe he is. There's a high chance that he is, but you know what? Fuck it. it the point is, even though these actors are getting to that stage fast, doesn't mean you can't get there with enough training. Uh, naturally, but it's going to take you longer. It's not going to take you six months like a lot of these actors. And I, I personally don't know how long they train for, but just realize that a lot of Hollywood actors aren't roiding up. That's their, that's their special strength training. It's not their magical routine. No, it's called roids for a very small amount of time to get the muscle mass quickly. That's all it is. So that's that next question. Yo, Alex, I got a giraffe neck and want to know if neck and trap training would make my neck seem more proportionate to the rest of my body. Absolutely, man. If you have a long skinny neck, start training that motherfucker. Really, you you want to train your neck in that person. Like, seriously, why would you not? Why would you actually make it stick out even more? Imagine this. Imagine you get all these muscles, right? Big shoulders, wide lats, big arms, all that. And now you got a fucking giraffe neck. To me, that looks stupid. Actually, I knew a couple guys like that. I knew a couple guys like that in person, man. They'd have really big arms. Fuck, but they look so, so, so bad because they had like super long necks and it was skinny as fuck. It was like a 14-inch pencil, pencil neck, but they had these big muscles. It looks terrible. It looks really, really, really fucking bad. So definitely do direct work for your neck. And you probably have more strength potential as well and more mass potential because your neck is higher up. I mean, look at guys who have uh, long necks. A lot of them have pretty nice straps too. I know Ziz had a long neck. His straps are one of his best body parts because it attaches on the neck too. So the high attachment point, once your traps bulk up, are gonna look pretty nice. So yeah, definitely focus on your yoke. You don't wanna be this the skinny fucking pencil neck guy with these big muscles. It doesn't look good whatsoever. So that's that next question. When you talk about high exercise selection, do you mean switching every week or every couple months? Uh, I mean having a program that does more than just the basics, more than just squat bench deadlift with a fucking uh, curl and a tricep extension. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, for example, in Naturally Enhanced, I have over 300 exercises to choose from. Over 300. That pretty much covers you for a lifetime. Whereas if you look at a lot of these cookie cutter programs, it's going to say, do squat, bench press, deadlift, a curl of your choice, a uh, fucking uh, reverse fly, you know, and maybe something else. Like it's, it's very minimalist in its approach. And they're going to have very few exercise rotations. So for the bench, you're going to say, go from flat barbell bench to flat dumbbell bench, or go from flat dumbbell bench to weighted dips. And for overhead press, 
do shoulder press, do barbell overhead press, and do the seated version. You know, you see what I'm saying? The rotations, they don't have that many rotations, and they just stick on this basic fucking approach, which results in a lot of strength plateaus, uh, muscular imbalances, the whole nine yards. And that, that's why in, in elite naturals, you tend to see that they're very strong on a multitude of movements, not just the fucking basics. So exercise selection, when I talk about high exercise selection, it refers to having many movements in a program. It doesn't mean switching out every week. It just means having a lot of movements, period, okay? Like you could, sw you could switch out every month if you want. You could switch out every fucking three months. Uh, the, the high exercise selection it doesn't have to be every single week, even though that's what I do. I personally wrote it every single week. It doesn't have to be like that. It just means your program has more than just the fucking basics. You know, and a lot of bodybuilders do this, believe it or not. So that's our next question. Yo, Alex, Zerker squat and deadlifts versus regular squat and deadlift. What should you be doing? And what are the pros and cons of doing one instead of the other? Do both. Why are you going to limit yourself to just like, if you're asking me this question, it means you realize that they do have benefits, right? So do, do, do your Zerkers, do your back squats. Why just say, okay, fuck Zerkers, I'm only going to do back squat. Like the benefits are as follows, right? Zerker lifts is going to strengthen the tendons and ligaments right over here. It's going to strengthen the fuck out of it because you got to hold a super heavy weight. It, it, it just, it is what it is. Like I see so many guys, they try unloading 135 and they're complaining that they have pain. It's like, really? 135? I could load 585 and more and I don't have pain in this area. And I don't even use a fucking towel or anything. So it builds pain tolerance, which uh, a lot of guys, they fucking lack. So definitely that's what I see the benefit of a Zerker lifts. It also, it builds the thoracic strength because it's got to be very upright. It tends to have carryover to Atlas Stones if you do strongman, you know. It teaches you to sit back and spread your knees apart. It's actually the ultimate squat for teaching really good form. You know, it's a very fucking good squat. And the back squat, well, you know what the benefits are. You've seen a million tutorials. I don't have to repeat it, right? It's just a simple back squat. It is what it is. But my advice is do fucking both. Do Zerker, do back squat, do front squat, do the whole nine yards. Why just limit yourself like that, man? And yeah, that's my answer to you. Next question. How detrimental would it be to completely swap the barbell bench for dumbbell? And how important is the barbell bench compared to the dumbbell counterpart? You have to look at it within the overall context of the program. Why are you benching in the first place? What is your purpose for doing a barbell bench press? Are you trying to do it for powerlifting purposes? Because it seems to me like you're not. It seems to me like you're just doing this for muscle gain in the pecs. And in that case, being straight up with you, you can probably get away with just doing fucking uh, dumbbell bench press and its variations as well as chest flies. You can probably build a, a great chest doing that approach. Do I recommend it? No, I think that uh, the barbell version is a must do. Of course, I do have that powerlifting bias in there, but yeah, you can definitely still build a great chest using dumbbells only. And especially like when we look at the goal aspect of things, why do you bench in the first place? Like for me, I took a year off from benching for the most part, like 11 and a half months so I could focus on my overhead press. And if I felt like doing a dumbbell press, I would do a fucking dumbbell press. So it's not like you're losing out on any benefits. You can easily just do an overhead press, some flat dumbbell press and some fucking flies and you get all the mass you need. Or you could do weighted dips as your primary mass building movement and do a uh, dumbbell bench as an accessory lift, you know? So it depends on what your goals are, man. Why are you benching in the first place? That's what you have to answer for yourself. So that's that next question. Yo, Alpha, I go to college and having a part-time job delivering pizza on a bike. I get a lot of cardio in, but still have a lot of belly fat. Will cutting my calories just a bit counter evenly by eating into my fat stores or not? Thanks for the vids. Uh, yeah, man, listen, you could be doing all this cardio, but if you're in a calorie surplus, you're gonna be gaining fat. And that's a big misconception. A lot of guys that say cardio burns belly fat. No, it doesn't. It makes it easier to do so because it puts you in a calorie deficit. But sometimes it doesn't put you in a deficit. Sometimes you just, you end up burning a little bit and you're actually at fucking maintenance or you're actually in a surplus still. You'd be very surprised. Like I, I actually recommend that guys do cardio while bulking for their health. You know, so if guys can bulk while doing cardio, what does it say about cutting? Well, it shows that it's not how you lose weight. You even have, you have guys that are doing marathon type workouts. They're not losing any weight. Why? Because they eat too much. When they're done their cardio, they're starving. So they eat so much food that they don't lose any weight. So that's how I see it. For me, I see cardio as a health building activity and it makes it easier to be in a calorie deficit. So if you're like 2,500 calories maintenance, you've done, like you had all your food, then you do cardio for like an hour. Now you're in a deficit. But that said, you still have to be eating the proper way. So my advice for you is count your calories. Count your calories, find out, are you in a deficit or not? Because chances are, you are not. If you have a belly and you're doing all this cardio, delivering pizza and shit on your fucking bike, you're not eating properly, man. So that's what you got to correct. Next question. Is it a terrible idea to go right into deadlifts after box squats, or do you think it was my previous back injury that led me to Snap City? Any feedback would be much appreciated. Uh, I think it was your previous back injury because most guys actually do this order. If you look up any powerlifting program... 99% of them have squat first, deadlift after. That's just the nature of how things go. So 
I think that you're the one who's been having issues here. You've probably been using bad form or you have some type of overuse injury and it kind of developed to a point where you got snapped the hell up. So I would not blame the order. You would probably have the same thing if you deadlifted first and squatted after, if not worse. So I would not blame the order, man. I think you have some issues that you got to really delve in. Like you got to dive into it. You got to find out what the root cause is because there's thousands of lifters that do the exact same thing as you. They squat first, they deadlift after. Zero injuries are appearing. So you got to look at yourself here. So that's that. Next question. Yo, Alex, I'm not vascular at all and want to ask you if you have any advice or is it solely genetics? Uh, it's not solely genetics. All of us have veins. You are aware that you have veins, right? And uh, the only reason why you can't see them is because there's fucking fat on top of it or other things covering it, you know? Here's the thing. If you want to become more veiny, you have to A, cut your body fat down. So you can't be like, you can't be bare mode. Let's just be real, right? You can't be 20% body fat expecting to be Mr. Vascular. No, you got to be more lean to do that shit. Like uh, in most cases, you got to be sub 15% if I'm being real with you. But even in those cases, sometimes you're going to have more veins in different areas. So that's one thing. You got to cut your body fat Two, You have to recognize that fat distribution is a real thing. Like for me, the fat goes directly to my fucking biceps, which sucks ass. It does not go to my triceps. It goes right to the fucking bicep. So I never see my bicep vein until I get very lean for the most part, you know, uh, but some guys that I know, like they're going to have huge fucking bellies, but they got shredded calves or shredded quads. That happens. So it depends on where the fat distributes. That's a really, really big one right there, as well as your body fat. And then also the salt intake. If you have too much salt, your veins are going to be blurred out. So you got to reduce your salt, right? Drink more water. And of course, up your carbs. If you up your carbs, some people say that because the molecules are bigger, it's going to have an effect on your veins. That's why when you drink a lot of alcohol, you look fucking veiny right afterwards, you know? So that's that should explain things, man. In summary, lose a bit of weight. Recognize that it's fat distribution. Uh, cut your salt back a little bit, increase your water, increase your carbs. That's going to make you look more veiny. Next question and last question of the week. Why do you use imperial units, foot, inches, pounds, since you're not an American? That's actually an interesting question, man. It has to do with the fact that I got into YouTube fitness in 2009, right? Which is a very long time ago, might I add. So 2009, there was pretty much no one. There was Scott Herman, Scooby, and Louis Marco. Yeah, Louis Marco existed during this time. And there was also six-pack shortcuts. Th these are the only sources that you saw for the most part. There were a few other guys that were like scammy and you see a lot of uh, body transformations and shit. But YouTube fitness was really at its birth. Like I was in it since the fucking dawn. You know, I didn't make videos, but I would watch these guys, right? Actually, Scott Herman had around 20,000 subscribers at the time. Elliot Hulse had 19,000 subscribers. I was there, man. I was fucking there. He used to, man, I'm an OG up in this bitch. So that said, all these guys were Americans. There was no, there was no uh, British channels. You know, there was no European channels. It was all fucking Americans, dude. Like, they founded this shit for the most part. And these guys used the Imperial units. When they would talk about lifting weights, I'm doing 135. That's what they would say. And I just got used to the way that they spoke. And I, and I watched YouTube Fitness for fucking years. Years and years and years before I created my own channel. And then when I made my own channel, what did I do? I repeated the same thing. I started referring to things in terms of uh, inches, right? I started using pounds instead of kilograms. I didn't even know that most of the world uses fucking kilos. I thought... Most people understood that it was pounds. So yeah, man, I got to blame you Americans, man. I'm Canadian. So actually in Canada, we use the metric system. But for lifting weights, I, I refer to pounds and things like that. When I look at my weight, I'm looking at pounds. I'm not looking at kilos. So that's it, man. It has to do with my, uh, my upbringing of watching a lot of uh, fitness videos by Americans. So God bless America. And uh, that's it for today's Q&A. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you got more questions, leave them down below and I will answer them next week.